everyone. We are back again with our Eden Up webinar uh, series. Uh, today, we are very much pleased to have with us uh, married Nick Jolla Mihil. Uh, she is going to uh, introduce, present us a, a very interesting uh, topic, something, um, an area for research and deepening where we are all uh, involved some way since making strategies for MOOC research. We really much thank you, uh, Marriott, for, for your participation. I know you are at a conference or so away from your office and anyway, you are available today uh, to give this webinar uh, with us. I will just steal a few uh, moments uh, to introduce uh, the event, uh, which is uh, offered within the Eden NAP Network of Academics and Professionals uh, to its uh, uh, membership. Uh, as you know, as Network of Academics and Professionals, uh, we uh, try to uh, involve the community of our members, of the members of Eden Network of Academics and Professionals, of course. We support uh, networking of individual members also through these kind of uh, uh, events. We uh, try to um, support uh, effective meeting and communication among our members through different channels. Uh, the Eden chat will follow uh, this uh, uh, webinar at six, so don't miss it. And it is uh, coordinated, of course, by a steering committee that I'm representing, but uh, I'm glad that today also Alfredo Soheiro, who is uh, the vice president of, uh, of the steering committee, uh, is there with us uh, supporting Mary Red uh, today. Uh, here you have uh, pictures uh, and names of uh, the people involved in the steering committee so that you can uh, match a face to, uh, to the names. Uh, we are all involved in promoting our um, uh, activities. Uh, you have also the possibility as SNAP members uh, to participate in our uh, platform, so don't hesitate and uh, uh, go to the NAP members uh, area where you can find information about all uh, the people uh, connected there. Uh, being a, a member uh, include a series, uh, includes a series of services and benefits that are listed here, um, different ones. Uh, I just mentioned uh, the fact that you can delegate up to 30 individuals uh, in the NAP and that you can attend conferences uh, at the reduced fees and the incoming conference in Bruges will be a very interesting one so I really support uh, uh, your participation in that. Um, our uh, challenges, uh, our uh, involvement is uh, uh, aimed at uh, uh, professional development, first of all, so through webinars, through Eden Chats, through uh, communication, through um, um, networking events at conferences uh, where uh, we uh, organize uh, um, uh, this uh, road to 
uh, uh, event where uh, people can meet in a speed up meeting, uh, introducing their uh, own research interests and creating new research groups. But and this is very Antonella important, I think, when we meet at uh, conferences. Inviting us um, to and so, this, uh, uh, I want uh, still more time, but with this slide, I uh, really recommend you to uh, register for our 28th uh, Eden Annual um, Conference in that will be held in Bruges, um, Belgium, in Northern Dublin, June 16th, um, it's very sunny outside. And, and a hotel, uh, Dom is um, the hashtag. Uh, uh, thank you, Mary Red. Uh, 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 the floor is So uh, if there is uh, any description to quality or if you hear some random things again, going we by, we've tried to get a place in the hotel which is quiet, etc. to do this. But as you know, anything could happen. So my apologies if that happened. So the eMOOCs conference was very, very interesting. We did this presentation. Uh, Crowher did the presentation mm -hmm. earlier on today. And it's part of a wider research agenda that we have in the National Institute for Digital Learning in Dublin City University. We are very much focused on MOOCs and on research in general, but particularly because of um, a research agenda into digital that we've developed with uh, Professor Mark Brown. I'm head of the Ideas Lab, which is an innovative unit um, founded to particularly um, look at how we can ingrain digital innovations within to the wider university curriculum. So we get to do a lot of research, a lot of testing, and a lot of evaluation and working with faculty across the university. So we have a, a huge remit in my, uh, in my institution, but one of the things um, that we thought was, would be interesting to discuss today would be what we have learned through our last few years of MOOC research, and just to talk about how these things are very, very important. These have linked well, actually, into some of the main issues that that have come true in the eMOOCs conference, which was attended by most of the major platforms, um, both within Europe and globally. We had Coursera, we had edX, we had FUN, we had FutureLearn. We've had a wide range of inputs. And it was really interesting to see that some of the issues that they are now grappling with um, as they are moving into the next phase of development. And we know that development is linked around issues around recognition um, recognition of short courses, then moving into the micro-credential space, space, and then moving into full stackable online degrees. Um, I think from our point of view, that was very, very interesting because I know our institution is very much going in that way and looking at that. And we will have a major announcement with respect to this in the coming weeks. But to give you context, it was very interesting to hear of the notions of, we know that Class Central in their last research over, they have identified nearly approximately 452 ways that badges and alternative digital credentialing has been done um, by various stakeholders who are providing digital learning via short courses and by longer courses. So there's, there's a shakeout happening in the field, which is really, really very, very interesting um, from that perspective of it. And I suppose our research agenda in DCU and in the NIDL mm. is particularly to have, is particularly to look at um, issues where trying to shape the research agenda. So from that, this is why this research is particularly important. Now I've spoken a lot um, thus far, but what we will hope to do is that the three of us will have a conversation. I'm sorry, I just muted or I've still my video because I'm very cognizant that I'm on uh, Wi-Fi from the hotel. So just in case, I know the audio will go through. So just in case anything happens. So what we'll do is Kruger is going to lead out on the uh, PowerPoint that we have here beside us. And then Elaine and myself will join in with individual research that we have been doing. So Kruger is engaged in research, in his own research. And I might just let him say a few things about his own research agenda. Um, initially to start off and then allow Elaine then to come in and, and to introduce herself as well in her research. So I'll just 
Mr. Kroger. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm a second year doctoral student um, and I research on the online courses that we have through the FutureLearn platform. Um, my own research is geared towards the psychology and motivational aspects of language learning. Uh, so it's quite a specific field in one way, uh, but it also has much broader resonance um, and it is involved kind of usage of a lot of different methods and instruments. And it's been really interesting to actually grapple with those issues and uh, design appropriate research. So a lot of what I've been looking at over the last couple of days has been to do with seeing how other people are researching, what the broader research agendas look like um, with other institutions. Part of our presentation today was talking about how we're in a kind of, certainly a unusual if not unique position um, in the kind of MOOC that we run, a language MOOC. It's quite interesting and unusual in that regard. Um, so that's my kind of research, a blend of sort of psychology and then obviously the technological aspects as well. Uh, and I work closely with Elaine on that as well. So just to bear with us because this is to Elaine, yeah. Elaine and I'll, I'm going to freeze. Hello, so uh, my name is Elaine and I'm actually a final year um, PhD student in uh, Dublin City University. And very similar to Kroher, I'm looking at the psychology of learning, um, but specifically at emotions and the different emotions that people feel as they learn um, in a MOOC. Um, it is obviously a very prominent area at the moment. A lot of people are becoming very interested in this in the wider educational area. Um, and it's beginning, there's a good few studies now happening in the MOOC area as well, but kind of different, I suppose, to previous studies is I'm looking at self reports of learner emotions. So really getting it straight from the learner's mouth. What is, how are they feeling as they progress through a course? And uh, also a little bit different from most studies so far is it's really embedded in a theoretical framework. Um, that has come from the field of education, and that is the control value theory um, that Peckron um, designed in 2000, uh, 2006. So it's very much um, relevant to a wider field, but I'm looking specifically at MOOCs um, and language MOOCs in particular, and that, that being our Irish 101 um, series. And I think Kroger will tell us a little bit more about that as we go along, and I hope to input with some examples from from my approach as well as we talk through the presentation. So I look forward to that. So I hope that format works and we hope that the video link and that the audio link remain, <laughs> remain constant throughout. From my part of it, I have um, a particular interest into the macro and the micro uh, implementation of innovation and change within higher education on a wider scale. So I think we have a breadth of uh, experience and research that we engage in. So we're, we'll move on now to the presentation. But at any time, if you would like to ask us particular questions or you would like us to engage with some of your own responses, please use the chat. And um, we'd be very grateful uh, for we're very grateful for questions on that. And again, if at any stage we fall off. Uh, the Wi-Fi connection, our apologies. So we'll start the presentation now. Well, Great. Um, so we'll probably essentially follow the way we did present it um, at eMOOCs. Uh, it was an interesting discussion and we had actually quite a few comments uh, as well. So I think it kind of did its purpose or did its job in that sense. Uh, but to introduce the topic itself, so you're seeing a slide here of the first of our courses and um, it's in a series of courses into the Irish language and Irish culture uh, they're delivered through the future learn platform um, and there's eight of them at present now we launched them last year in January 2018 and since then they've been really incredibly successful uh, but also when you come to a conference like this what's interesting is uh, they're quite unusual uh, Elaine and Mairead have done an excellent study that actually looked at the number of language MOOCs that exist and I think, guys, it was about 150 or something a yeah. few years ago. Um, but the vast majority of those MOOCs that did exist were English, French, they were global languages. Um, so 
by my count, I think we're one of only about three minority language MOOCs. There's a Frisian one and a Maori one in New Zealand as well. Um, but I don't think there's another one at present. So we're in a... Yeah, and we're also, um, when we use the term minority language, we're talking about lesser youth language. We understand that there are some global languages spoken by millions of people which are termed that. So we understand that. Mm. So just with regard to the research that we did um, on those um, language MOOCs, one of the interesting things was that English, Spanish and Chinese were the main global languages, but it was English for particular purposes in very specific domains. So that was quite interesting. Um, and also with respect to Spanish, I think we felt that from the research and the findings that Chinese was coming through, but it was coming through in more of a holistic way. Um, I suppose with this series of MOOCs that we have relating to the Irish uh, language, they're co-funded by the Department of Culture, Heritage and the Gaeltacht on the 20-year strategy for the Irish language. So we had a huge input, um, not only from funding wise, but from um, our department, our, our, our gov government departments. And the reason that they were put out was because of this global connection. So the government saw that MOOCs were means by which we could connect to a diaspora. As you are maybe aware, we have a huge diaspora of Irish people um, globally most particularly sent to in, sent in North America and in where you'd expect from English, Australia, New Zealand, etc. But I think one of the one of the things we'll talk about mm. is that is that a lot of data is given about MOOCs and it's all about you know how many registrations and that and in the initial research on MOOCs it was all about um it was all about numbers, how many people are registered and the huge figures and that was the thing that was important. But I think what we found in this is that, yes, we've had those big numbers, but when we're going into a lot of the clickstream data, et cetera, mm. what we've been mostly focused on and what we've been trying to do our research on is the interaction patterns and tying that up with other data formats that have come through the MOOC, such as discussion, where we've had textual mm. analysis, et cetera. But we'll speak more to that um, through the presentation. But it's just interesting in that... And as well for uh, reporting, you can imagine that um, our government is very keen on how many people have registered to do this, how many of them have finished it, etc. And what we've been able to report uh, is on levels of, of interactivity, but also give them some research into what um, the global diaspora and people who are interested and who have taken on this, the sort of trends that they have um, with respect to their participation and their motivations. Mm. And I think that's got a lot to do with your own research for her in that space. So we might move on to the mm -hmm. next slide. Yeah, and actually that sets it up really well for kind of what we were talking about earlier, which was when we're approaching from a specific perspective, I mean, we're researching on technology and MOOCs, but we're very well embedded in, in wider literatures, so linguistic literatures and the like. And one of the most interesting things about that is you can kind of put on a critical hat. Um, and there has been actually a good bit of literature in the last couple of years that we've drawn upon uh, pointing out this clickstream data and this in a sense, and it's something that you even see at the conference, massive emphasis on particular forms of data. Uh, completion rates often very important, despite the fact that they're you know, there's a, there's a wider debate about how useful that metric is, but even the likes of using data, the, these billion data points uh, to actually say, look at what a, a typical learner is doing, but that it does link through to, and it's always scary to use the kind of philosophical words, but a kind of neo-positivistic view where you're sort of measuring engagement in a very specific way, a static way, um, and that even though we have these massive reams of information, uh, it's much easier to conduct a study in a MOOC in the sense that it generates so much data just through people participating in the MOOC. Um, but the actual interpretation of the data, often when you read a MOOC, a report that's based on a MOOC or a MOOC research, is often a very narrow framework, or, or it's just essentially just looking at X and Y, seeing what the relationship is between the two. Um, but that some of the more interesting things, as Mairead says, actually relate to the social dynamics and the interactions and what kind of meanings people draw from things as well. I think that's very important. So we did put in this um, fabulous picture uh, downloaded from Shutterstock, but just trying to talk about these theoretical bridges. So if you have a massive stream of information on the one hand, um, it is in and of itself not necessarily useful if you don't have a particularly you know, salient or good way of connecting it to some 
broader insight that you're trying to say. And it seems often with a lot of MOOC research also that there's not as big a focus on tying it to the wider literatures that already exist. So we did make reference to Martin Weller's study, a very interesting one, which was to do with the various literatures relating to open educational resources and the like and showed that if you actually cluster it out by references, citations, the MOOC literature is quite peripheral. It, it doesn't link through to where there's already been findings, maybe 30, 40 years worth of findings that are probably very relevant in MOOC contexts. So there's a danger as well that if you're not aware of that literature, that you're kind of reinventing the wheel, or maybe you're not drawing from these really rich and existing fonts, things that people already know. So I think from the theoretical approaches are really, really important. and you know, we do, we have, and we've done quite a number of literature reviews, both mm. systematic and scope, and, and there is, we have a plethora of empirical, uh, of empirical studies, etc., which, you know, we have no issue with, but I think at this stage, as Crover said, it's linking that, that to the theory is re or to theories is very, very important, whether it's both from an inductive or a deductive um, process, mm. or both, um, Sorry, we can't hear very right anymore. Something might have happened. As I told you, she is, uh, and as she actually she told us, uh, she is um, in Naples attending a conference. Mary Red, are you there? Something might have happened to the, to the connection. Let's wait a couple of minutes and see what happens. In the meantime, a sort of survey here, which is your experience with MOOCs and actually um, more than attending MOOCs, which is your experience with design of MOOCs and your use of MOOCs within teaching and learning activities. I hope we're back. Are we back? Can anyone answer? So sorry for Can that. Can anyone answer this question? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> apologies for that. It was, as I said, um, I think we leave the video off because just in case we're running it too tight. Um, so what, if that's okay, so. Good. 
Uh, again, apologies for that. But as I said, we are in a hotel lobby, so we're doing mm. our best with uh, what we have. So um, we'll just take it up from there. I think. Yeah, we'll... we could probably go to the next slide, Mr. Um To entertain the audience, yeah, but it's so... better that you go on. Excellent. OK. Um, so what we had started looking as well was, of course, at these different forms of research. So I think Mairead was mentioning about uh, context and the importance of this and field specific findings. Um, and one that helped us as we've actually started looking at this has been this distinction between variance and process based research. Um, so obviously, when you see this at first, it kind of sounds like it's very similar to um, a, a split between quantitative and qualitative. But it's actually quite different in a sense. Um, variance is, of course, if we have, you know, could be 100 persons or could be 10 persons, but we're comparing them across case where, and we're looking for kind of an average and an aggregate. Um, and most MOOC research definitely seems to fall into this category. We look at interaction, uh, we look at kind of social dynamics, how people are uh, working with course materials using a variance based logic. But the other one that you can use that's equally valid, and definitely there seems to be far fewer studies, is this process-based approach where you're looking at it actually across time unfolding. Uh, weirdly enough, MOOC runs themselves are fantastic uh, case studies because you could literally have the, even as learners start to get used to each other, they start to interact with each other. Um, but it's rare enough that a study actually takes that sort of lens. And it seems that, and even the last few days, we've probably noticed a lot of this is to do with generalizability that a lot of learner or a lot of researchers, I should say, uh, really want the idea of coming up with generalizable findings that can work across many different types of MOOCs. Um, but there's actually ample space there to try and understand uh, these process-based contextual case studies using individual runs and the like. So it follows, of course, as well that, I mean, all of our research probably falls into the um, the domain of mixed methods research. We make use of a lot of different sources of data uh, as we do conduct it. And we've got kind of three examples that we use um, of our research and kind of giving applied examples because it's always better and more useful, I think, for someone who's listening, if we can kind of show what we mean in context. So we will talk about that, uh, but we'll also talk about the importance of this concept of field specific knowledge. So that it's not just MOOC research, it has to surely tether to something uh, deeper and bigger. Also, pragmatically for researchers, I think it's probably better. It gives you more kind of ways to pitch your research when you're talking to people as well um, and to interact with other researchers and maybe find collaborators as well. Okay. So, so these are our three examples. Uh, as I was saying at the talk this morning, uh, we can't claim to have invented any of these terms. Uh, they're, they're quite well established terms, but also, as I say, talking about them in context uh, might be useful for any other researchers out there also. Uh, so we'll take each one in three. Yeah, so um, I think I'll speak about the data triangulation because it draws very much on what I'm doing. Um, and it gives us, uh, I, can, I can show some examples from my work on how we've used um, this to really <coughs> Uh, enhance our data collection and tell us so much more than we would have got from just one method alone. So as I said before, I'm looking at emotion in a MOOC and getting self reports to collect that kind of data. So uh, if anyone, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the uh, method of experience sampling, but this is when you collect um, feedback from individuals, be that about their opinions, their feelings, uh, their thoughts, uh, at regular time, at, at over time, but within the moment that it's felt. So, in an educational context, that would be while they're uh, engaged in a learning process or in a task or activity. And that's what I did. I um, measured learners' emotions at multiple points throughout the course. And this was usually uh, immediately following a task in that course. So, there was our course itself was three weeks long. And we, uh, so I had 18 data collection points during that course. So there was about six per week. Um, and these were these were kind of mapped against the different task types that we had in the course. They were discussion, quizzes, um, articles, which were kind of usually very text based. And um, 
What was our other one? Videos. So they were kind of four different task types. And I looked at people's emotions during these different task types. Um, and these were true, uh, very, very short, uh, concise surveys that they answered following those tasks. And from that, we got a um, very big response, thankfully. So for over the 10,000 people who enrolled in the course, over 3,000 responded to at least one of those surveys. So uh, a nice large sample from which to interpret the data. And they, um, for one example, um, referring back to the data triangulation was, for a specific ta task, learners were, it was a video, and learners were um, introduced for the first time to a conversation uh, using the Irish language. Um, they'd been kind of introduced to phrases prior to that, but this was the first time that they heard two people speaking the language together. Um, they responded to the surveys. The sentiment or the emotions reported during, in that survey were, were extremely positive. Um, high reports of curiosity, um, enjoyment, pride, um, and these these shone through really strongly. Um, and that was one inter that was from our survey results. But when we went then and looked at the task or th the task itself and the comments posted um, it, uh, below that task, they were extremely negative. And this was not represented in the as 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 clearly in the survey data. Um, but it gave us a new perspective from, on which to look at this task and really see that it gave us something to think about with regards to the survey results, but also um, pe how people post in a course and maybe it, is it truly representative of what people feel? Are the majority of people just happy to move on and they don't want to post? Um, and how much of those kind of how representative are the comments to the overall sentiment with the course? So. You can see from those two, we had very quantitative survey results for which people just uh, were asked to report at, from a list of emotions to us kind of doing a thematic sentiment analysis of comments. Um, and we got two very different findings from that, um, which both have, have, uh, have value depending on which way you want to look at them. Um, and kind of if you repeat that over time, it's, it's that's how you get the value of it as well. Yeah. Um, and I think then, Croho, you also had um, a data triangul triangulation uh, designed into your research design. Do you want to have a little chat about how you did that? Yeah, of course. Um, so I had read actually a lot of the literature about mixed methods and kind of came upon a nice sort of phrase, uh, a little bit daunting sound at first, but this idea of using them dialectically. So that means that um, when I was designing my survey, I knew straight away that it's really important in any sort of survey design to really account for the fallibility of an instrument. And when I say fallibility, I mean, it can be statistically valid, it can come out with some great results, but where it gets very interesting is if you give people the opportunities and responses to actually comment on the survey itself. So for example, at the bottom of the survey, I specifically asked for feedback, were there any questions that you thought were a little bit off or anything that you'd phrase differently? and ended up with really a wealth of information from even little things that are actually very telling about the research. So, for example, I had a question at the start about what one's nationality was, um, and I had a couple of responses from people saying that they were kind of offended that they could only pick one nationality, because you had a lot of people who said, well, I'm Irish, but I, you know, I've lived in England all my life, but I'm Irish, so I should be able to use both. And that's very interesting straight away about the relationship between, for example, learners national identity and who they are and obviously in a motivational study that's very telling sorts of evidence and this is this kind of supporting evidence argument as well and um, but also from the start uh, I used kind of like a battery of responses to kind of measure people's motivations but I also left open boxes at the end aware that any scale I could create would not encompass every motivation there'd always be ones and so when I thematically analysed all those open responses, came up with some really new questions that were then filtered into the survey design uh, for the second run, specifically because I was kind of saying from the start, this is sort of exploratory, hasn't really been done before. We kind of know a lot of reasons that people will be doing it, but there's bound to be novel ones, uh, things you would not expect, like uh, people doing it for health purposes, where they're talking about, you know, Sudoku, I like learning a language that I find kind of difficult. Um, I'm doing it just for fun. Uh, I'm doing it because my grandkids can speak Irish. They go to an Irish language school and I want to be the cool grandparent. 
that was an actual response. <laughs> um, so everything under the sun you can imagine, it was there. And it's important to account for that. So that's another form of triangulation where we kind of exploit the weaknesses of the methods. Because, for example, with a survey, what you ask is what you ask. You don't get another you know, chance to expand or elaborate on the data you have. And that might connected. be why data triangulation is actually really, really important. That Absolutely. it gives you that opportunity to delve into you know, developing out themes, etc. that have Absolutely. arisen from one method, mm. um, which is very, very important. I think from my own research point of view um, and some of the research I've conducted related to this and, and policy implementation is that independent of whether it's textual data that you're mining or whether you're looking at interview data is that that triangulation is a really, really important feature. So I think for us in the MOOC context, we decided that this was mm. the an approach that we should use to validate not only the types of questions, but also to to let to allow us to increase the types of Absolutely. questions that we are answering because we wanted to ask um, a little bit more complex than what pure survey data would allow us and you can even from the types of things that Elaine is doing mm -hmm. and what Crutter is doing is that there are areas that yes you can have a very uh, you can use a survey instrument and you will get that as you said today that table at the end absolutely and it's underwhelming and it's underwhelming yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. so that that you're able to sort of drill down more into that that was very very important but that also gave you the ability then to ask not only the question which the table represented but then to have deeper questions and I think when we were looking at MOOC research and doing our literature reviews and both of you have done quite enough uh, in-depth literature reviews in your in, in the, the two areas you're looking at is that there is an absence of that and that some question types are not being asked so mm. i think data triangulation from that perspective is allowing us to ask um, is allowing us to engage with deeper questions um, and i think broader questions from a from a research point of view absolutely so we'll just move on to longitudinal research do you want to take this for Sure. So um, obviously the, the word is used a lot and I mean, it literally means looking at something over time. Um, but essentially the way we were looking at it, I think from the start mm -hmm. is this concept of change, researching change and um, similar to kind of what we were talking about with the survey instruments. Uh, anything you take, if you take a single survey instrument, is a snapshot at that very yeah. particular moment. So that's that notion of, as opposed to being change, it's changing as it's an active form. You exactly. Know? Yeah. And that's what's really interesting too, is that, and even when it's tracked over the length of a course or over multiple courses, and that is, that's where you definitely do see a lot of kind of longitudinal survey studies, uh, which are very interesting. But the way we were kind of looking at it too is we've noticed even on our own MOOCs, when you see the same faces, the same names over and over again, uh, another way to look at it longitudinally is to flip it around and instead of saying, you know, a thousand learners, this is a survey response at X, Y, Z point, individual learners and track them over time. So mm -hmm. for example, I've only interviewed one person so far, but I'm engaging in interviews yeah. and part of the plan, it's about their motivations to learn the language, but part of the plan I actually have is to get back in touch with them in maybe six months time because I'm really curious, we have a series of MOOCs, so they get kind of progressively diff more difficult. And I'm curious that uh, if these MOOC learners and the one interview I did do, for example, she was very positive, she was ready to move on to the next steps. Will she actually be doing it in six months time? She's atypical in that, as we were saying about completion rates and stuff, most learners don't, in the kind of technical sense, complete a MOOC. There's a lot of literature as to why it's problematic to even look at it that way. Um, but most don't, but the ones that do are actually kind of probably very interesting and unique just in terms of their not being that typical. Um, so sometimes we're kind of, we always want to generalize our results and that is very important. But the other side theoretically is actually the outliers or the, the less typical persons are actually also really interesting. And we had a great discussion and actually a question came from the end about this concept of broadening the focus from, say, the in-platform activity, the clickstream stuff, what they engage in, to actually looking at beyond the MOOC. Does that influence, in my case, say, their motivations, you know, talking to people around them and things? Yeah, and I think that's the point, I think, that we're trying to get. We're not criticising um, mm. the studies that have taken place to date, because in every field and in every burgeoning field, there is a sort of a, 
you know, what seems to be a pathway that people follow as, as researchers follow as it becomes more, as the research becomes more refined. And I think we have, you know, we don't, and I think we should be cognizant as researchers in MOOCs that we're not a historical and we're not mm. a contextual. And we need to understand that. And that's why the broader focus. And if we know that learning happens, not just in the formal learning environment, we can't just disaggregate that from the lives of the learners and also from the wider social context in which they are in and also from where they have come. Mm. So I think that's it. And just coming back to one of the points that uh, Kuhlherm had made earlier, I think we have in our Eden paper that's in Bruges, Absolutely. Uh, we're looking at the serial MOOCs and the serial. So mm. you'll be get, you'll get to hear and plug in our own uh, paper <laughs> if you want <laughs> to go. Self-promotion. Self-promotion, there's no promotion <laughs> um, at the Bruges conference. And um, we'd be interested to hear your thoughts on the paper that we've developed, looking at and trying to track learning over a, a, a MOOC series mm. as opposed to just an individual MOOC. We know that it's not just an individual move because we are quite cognizant and will be, I suppose, theoretically, we'd be aligned with the stake mm. um, for where, you know, where case study and instrumental and in intrinsic Absolutely. case studies. And within that, we would come from that sort of, uh, I suppose, methodological standpoint tradition. and tradition. So looking at the next slide, um, I suppose the iterative re redesign, I think that's key, isn't it, really? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and it's kind of, it's something that I know Elaine can speak of as well, but it's been so interesting seeing the, uh, talking about something frankly and organically as well. So you'll notice that there's a little Irish there and that's a, a shanuckle, which means a proverb, Neil see gone luff. There's no wise man or woman without fault. And uh, that's an important one to, for any researcher to probably bear in mind is, it's not necessarily about a humbleness, but it's about the fact that the way we actually move knowledge forward is by acknowledging where we didn't do as well as we thought we would or where, you know, we ran into like road blocks or speed bumps or something. And we also like this concept of the logic in use um, that Maxwell developed. So he pointed out, and actually it's a lovely paper if anyone wants to look at the reference at the end. Uh, he pointed out that whenever you're reading a study, what you essentially get on the methodological side is a reconstructed logic. It's a story of how it was done and it's very clinical. It says everything about this was, you know, X, Y, Z, everything's very neat. But that's almost always not exactly how it went down because the logic in use was that you made decisions at certain points. Uh, you might have had to chop a question out. You might have had to look at a different method of data collection. Uh, that this logic in use is actually in a way the more useful uh, for researchers because it shows that problem side also. But it does tend to get cut out. I mean, often studies don't have enough space to kind of talk about these issues. Uh, but where there's real kind of value in these kind of papers, particularly in a budding field like MOOC research, uh, is that a lot of the kind of problems we face are probably quite similar. You'll notice probably uh, survey fatigue and um, respondents just won't maybe answer a long instrument. There's actually probably a point, an inflection point past which they're just not going to, you know, their legs yeah, they're just going to serve out. Yeah, so we've all kinds of like but contextual... That's, but, but that's a really cool thing, though, and I suppose with all the different survey instruments that we have, that we can, we, we now know where enough is enough. Mm, which uh, question <laughs> Which almost, question, yeah. and what questions are falling down on. So it gives you that iterative redesign where you can sort of say, okay, well, let's really think about my survey instrument. Do I need to have those sort of two introduction questions or should I just cut to the chase and mm. get to the really, like you said, the really good stuff? So I think that's been important. And I know on our third point here, I think Elaine has a particular to just like to talk to platform limitations because when we were going on initially onto the I think we were one of the first universities to engage with this type of research. And that was challenging for our platform providers. Yeah, definitely. It was something because when I when you come up with a, a research idea, you have this idealistic view of how you want it to work. Um, and how you see it happening uh, in the course. And when I was coming up with my research design, the course itself was only in the development phase too. So it was, it, was, it was a learning process all around. But what I wanted to originally do was to have the surveys as a pop-up that would appear amid mid-learning tasks. So they'd be embedded in the course um, itself and they'd be, it, it wouldn't rely on someone to have to uh, do anything extra to uh, answer the survey. They wouldn't have to click somewhere else. They wouldn't be moved off the platform to answer a survey. And I think that's 
key when you want to get in the moment reports like I was. I didn't want to interrupt the learning process. I wanted this to be part of what they were doing um, and to be nearly a reflective step yeah. in what they were doing. But it, because of the way platform, the platform was designed, this just wasn't possible. And it was, it was also the GDPR thing. At yeah, that so we had to have so many, we had to have a very lengthy disclaimer um, in advance telling people that they were leaving the platform, that they were now uh, answering a survey that belonged to Dublin City University. It was no longer part of the platform site. And while this is all understandable, it did inhibit the way that the survey came across on the platform. It looked a lot more substantial than that what was originally intended for it to be. Um, they probably spent more time reading the disclaimer than they did answering the survey. Oh, they did, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, so that was, and it just, it, it kind of, it interrupted what I intended to be a very seamless process. And I think it's something that we all kind of have to, and platforms need to address if they really want uh, research and more research that doesn't just associate itself with the background clickstream yeah. data. Mm -hmm. If we want to hear from the learners themselves, on the learner voice. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. what we've seen in so many of our comments is that learners want to be heard. They yeah. want to give Brilliant. us feedback. And we very much phrased um, this um, the surveys that we conducted as, can you help us? Can you give us something that you want us to know so we can help you? And that was kind of, and, you, and we, we really found that there were so many people more than willing to tell us what worked in the course, what didn't work, and many times unprompted mm. in the um, discussion, in the in the discussion steps or um, the just the the for, com, just comment forums under each task, people were set, would converse and they would have discussions among themselves, encouraging each other, and not so after reporting what they felt. But what I think is really interesting is that. Going back as well to what um, Kerr and Maraid were speaking about there, as people don't talk about uh, often enough what doesn't work, um, and it's just, it usually stops other people from making the same mistakes. We were all tending to report on how great something worked out instead of saying, "Well, I actually didn't intend for it to be that way," mm. um, and that would it opens up conversations for to a wider field. Yeah, and we know that there is a publishing yeah. bias Absolutely. against yeah. you know that type of framework. I think there was a very good article recently that actually, you know, mapped that out where mm. the went for, you know, the positive findings were more were significantly more likely to be published than findings were indicated. Well, there is no significant difference or they didn't, their mm. hypothesis failed or whatever. So I think that's a really, really important. Absolutely. Just to, I suppose, link into the EMUGS conference here, it was quite interesting to hear. And I don't know whether, of course, it could be just be the rhetoric of the major platforms, you know, talking about they were going to look into more of learning behavior and learner responses and they were certainly from what as it appeared that they were echoing each other mm. so it seems to be something that they must have got back in the surveys that they are conducting and yeah. the engagements that they are having with learners and mm. um, because it was definitely a clear message that they were trying to communicate to the MOOC research community I think um, in the last day I don't know what mm. you thought about that but yeah, no, it definitely seemed to be coming through that we can't just go off what we think we know. We really have to open it up now and and see what learners want to want from these from these things in any kind of field. If you're looking to to provide a service, you have to hear back from the people that are using that service, um, and that uh, seems definitely seems to be the way that the move platforms are now moving. We have the basics now. Mm. We know how to make the courses. We know the 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 kind of those basic fundamentals we now need to go beyond that uh, and look at the learner but in that way it's it, it has it hasn't been that this has been happening in other areas either Mo like things like emotion research are only coming to the fore okay um it's they, these haven't been addressed elsewhere either um but i think it's really important that we do jump on that trend um as it comes up because this is where uh, this is it, this will help in so many ways to support the learner in because there really are it's a, it's like a 4D experience yeah. it's not mm, just yeah. uh, interacting with content it's it's enhancing the whole experience for the for the learner mm. yeah. and I suppose it, I think it's a, it behoves us in the MOOC research community to keep pushing the boundaries with the platforms I know that when we first had the initial conversations about the type of research Elaine particularly want to conduct. It was it was challenging and there were tensions there because we were asking them when well, we need to have this particular design in place 
and you know we went through a very stringent ethical process on our review board mm. in our own university but i was delighted that we did that because mm. we were able to prove you know that what we were trying to do had value and was ethically sound and of course that mm -hmm. is um, a very key. very important key part of any research design yeah. mm. and i think a lot of by facing like challenges it doesn't mean you should stop because uh, following what we did yeah there the platform has changed a lot of their uh, disclaimer and yeah, yeah. um, policies because they realize that more of this needs to happen mm -hmm. and it's until you approach them and explain why this needs to happen a lot they probably they just aren't uh, if enough people say it then it'll become more of a, of a conversation that needs to be addressed but i think it was very it's interesting though because platforms or well, any commercial platforms it's they're looking at the bottom line, they're looking at yeah. selling the certificates, people upgrading, et cetera, et cetera. So whereas if you, you know, it's simple, you know, it's very, very simple. If you're the person who is engaged in this, the learner is satisfied, they're more likely to stay on the platform mm -hmm. and they're more likely to engage in other courses. So they see, I suppose, the monetary, and, yeah, it's the interest aligned, their interest aligned, and it just behoves us as researchers to, keep that in mind and not well not keep it in mind that they have a stake in the game as well but Absolutely. also that we have from a research perspective we have a, a stake in that we are pushing forward the most robust and rigorous research designs where for particular questions and I think that um, is just something as research community in relation to MOOCs that we have to keep doing and that's nearly sometimes independent of the platform mm. but though it doesn't matter which platform it is but we just need to keep doing that and i think that was clear from some of the presentations that were done as well that there is a little bit of a movement um towards that absolutely okay and we yeah i think we've the one slide we? yeah so we've the one slide for implications and conclusions and I, I know we've chatted quite a bit and um, so if anybody wants to throw up a question or anything i know we're coming towards the end we'd be very happy to do that so do you want to yeah so just to conclude kind of i guess it's kind of a lot of this is what we have been saying but i mean it comes from our experience or you know 15 months worth of kind of interesting journey and research is the first point is definitely about this role of theory that it is very important and i do think i don't know what my colleagues think but i do think that my opinion anyway is that when you do read a lot of mooc research there just isn't a strong theoretical framework or it's ignored you or know. it's ignored exactly yeah. where it's not it's considered secondary or, or that it's just in some cases taken for granted that yeah. people just know that it, it happens i think so that a lot with yeah. um, the emotion research was that people said would would make statements such as emotions uh, play a significant role in the learning process without building on that or mm. saying how and why yeah. they think that yeah. yeah or even why it's desirable like because yeah. you kind of got to think at that level haven't you as in tease it out yeah. properly and you know because then you but actually contextualize it as well like yeah you know i oh, know it's so important and like this um and this is where we've had an advantage probably is because we do read a lot on other subjects so it actually bleeds in quite well to the mooc stuff because you see these kind of debates they're already happening in other environments yeah. there you know a lot of these questions the things we were saying there about process and variance like these are foundational kind of social science questions across absolutely. the board yeah, like absolutely. nobody agrees necessarily on these so it's kind of interesting to see that process but it does appear that if you were looking at the literature and that Velizianos paper is a very good review yeah. there does appear to be a heavy weight in the one direction uh, which is that kind of you know variance based thing so I guess the second point follows kind of naturally, which is the importance of methods um, and also to look at kind of some of those alternative designs that, yeah. that probably don't appear very frequently. Case studies, they don't appear very often in MOOC research. Uh, thematic analysis of the comments is something that I would have thought is like very easy to do and, and quite kind of foundational because you have that information. But it's rare enough that you see that either. Or any real CA, you know exactly yeah and even like frameworks that you may not even necessarily agree with but like discourse analysis you yeah. could use that with you know comments and conversations uh, so these things about the questions that aren't being asked as well is probably an interesting direction yeah and i think you know i think today there was a you were at the presentation or was it yesterday about the you know that there could be a b yes on edx on yeah. edx and that was very interesting because on some of the platforms again it's the it's the tension of the platform infrastructure limitations 
but they've come across and they're they're now moving into where you can do that type of control testing and i think that's mm. that's going to be even from a variance perspective even if it's in that it's going to be actually fascinating fascinating and um, to see what comes out of that and and the people and the universities that are using that for research mm. how what they'll come out with and will they change their questions though like will the questions get any more in depth i don't know will they just improve the quality of their findings this is a big question isn't it and i mean it does and it seems to come back as well to the, the functionality of it a lot too which is you know the great thing about having a theory is you're feeding back into something of course you know yeah, your yeah, study's yeah. not mm-hmm. just about well i've shown the link between x and y that's often mm-hmm. very important but what does that link actually mean and are there ways to make yeah. does it follow that that makes something better or you know what are the kind of criteria and you use? this is something that actually came up in a research seminar that we had in the nidl the national institute mm. for digital learning and professor mark brown actually drew on this point where once you're finished a study that shouldn't be the end of the Absolutely. questions mm-hmm. yeah. you should only be asking more questions then or what Absolutely. questions does this study now raise that yeah. i know this what else should and that's really it draws on all the different points that we've 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 made on getting different types of data uh drawing out a process much longer as longitudinal research and also um doing the iterative rede- redesign of new questions where are we going now mm. um, and that's that's kind of what that is not what questions are we not asking and why aren't we asking those questions and are they important are they not and i think one of the issues that came up at one of the last sessions was you know the notion of scalability Absolutely. and i think that's where the MOOC platforms are in their head with regards to a lot of these issues. So they're looking at it from a point of view of how can they scale even more complex learning experiences, say in discipline where you have both the knowledge and the skills, which is very much in language learning, mm. um, and how that can scale up to um, in, in those disciplines. So I think that for us will be another interesting way when they start coming to grips with those type of issues because then of course then the learning design will change Mm -hmm. um, and then the learner experience will change and potentially then you know the areas that we're interested in the Mm -hmm. motivation etc that that um, will also change so i think you know we try to give you a flavor really of um the research that we're conducting and also try to include some of the highlights and some flavor of, almost yeah of the highest and you know where um the platforms are going because the platforms are leading us as well a little bit in this way because mm. of how they develop and how they you know does have it does bring to bear um you know a, an influence on some of our research and how we do it so but i think interestingly enough i think it's always very clear you're on the right way when a platform tries to <laughs> uh, copy what you're doing or <laughs> start getting very in, interested in sentiment and emotion because they they know that this is an area that they're going to have to think about because mm. at the end of the day, particularly the commercial ones, they do all have a monetization agenda, whether businesses. it's, they are businesses, you know, Harvard and MIT told like edX mm. immediately from the get-go that you have to become, develop that sustainable business model. And, you know, you know now with FutureLearn with their uh, venture with, you know, that they've got funding from, um, from Seek, we know now that they're also very much into looking at how their business model yeah. is going to be. And of course, even though all of them, all of them, and I say that they have a very good, um, that they're re- one of their rays on death is that of access to education and providing yeah. education. At the end of the day, they are businesses, and that's so we have to be very cognizant of mm. what they're trying to do as well. So just a very quick Gurmila Mahagwe, which is thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, we're happy to take that and take them. And will I hand back to Antonella or Christine or are you okay? So I don't see any questions coming. Oh, I see Monica in the chat. You've had a few um, come up. I'm sorry. Uh, and just apologies again for the break in the... Um, connection but um, hopefully you have it back and everything has been going fine so i think monica has i think we need e-learning MOOC for our students and teaching process because we respect their time yeah well, so <laughs> thank you so much Absolutely. That was a short one. <laughs> thank you so much thank I really that. thank you for your availability in you know in difficult in a difficult situation for connection and for being away from your office, uh, but uh, 
uh, notwithstanding that you are you have been wonderful you and all your colleagues uh, PhD students and and so on and so forth but now uh, I really um, would like to remind you the Eden chart uh, at six. Uh, so please, if you have other, um, uh, you know, thoughts, uh, or in these two hours you have the time, less than two hours actually, you have uh, um, uh, the opportunity to reflect on what we uh, discussed today with Maria and uh, her colleagues. Uh, don't miss uh, this opportunity uh, on uh, on the hidden chat where Merad will be available again. Thank you so much for this hard day with us. Uh, I also would like to remind you that um, uh, next uh, webinar uh, will be uh, held and hosted uh, by Alfredo uh, Soreiro. Uh, and uh, it will be again a very interesting um, opportunity for all of us. Uh, um, it uh, will be uh, devoted to um, portfolio and how to uh, build a, a portfolio in, uh, uh, you know, technologically supported. Anyway, thank you so much to all of you and have a nice day. Don't forget also to register to our uh, conference in Bruges. Bruges is fantastic. Don't miss it. Uh, here we, ha we have the, the, the title for the next webinar. So I want to remind you the webinar hosted by Alfredo Soreiro on uh, June the 5th, same time, 3.30 uh, Central Europe su summertime, possible use of a portfolio as European development. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.